Well, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, after a speech like that, I really feel like going back and sitting down. <laughs> I, ca I cannot rival it. But I would just like to say, welcome, welcome to Bournemouth, and welcome to Mr. Cameron's retirement party. <laughs> That's my last chance of getting a peerage. Oh, I've got one already. <laughs> Sorry. I asked our chairman what I should talk about, and he said, your Brexit experiences. But I would be grateful if you could be so infernally dull that the next speakers will appear brilliant by comparison. <laughs> well, after the last speech, I don't think that's going to be too difficult. Let us consider some of the threats we faced. From George Osborne warning us of spending cuts, tax rises, an emergency budget, if there was a vote, leave. David Cameron, it is deeply concerning that the Leave campaign is criticizing the Independent Bank of England. We should listen to experts. <laughs> when, they, when they warn us of the dangers to our economy of leaving the European Union. Former Attorney General Dominic Grieve told Newsnight that vote leave, the Vote Leave blueprint for exiting the EU would lead to a chaotic departure. Britain is stronger in Europe, said. The Leave campaign do not want to listen to economic experts <laughs> because they all agree that leaving the EU would wreck our economy and hammer family finances. It continued. On the 23rd of June, we can put our faith in the economic experts across the globe who believe our economy is stronger in Europe or take a leap in the dark with the Leave campaign. And now Wall Street banks eat their words on Brexit, all these experts. JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley warned of an economic slump on a Leave vote. The Wall Street banks donated one and a quarter million pounds to remain. These U-turns came as sterling rose above $1.34 to the pound for the first time since mid-July, having fallen to $1.25 following the vote. The OECD said a vote to leave would be a major negative shock to the UK economy. Now it says the outlook is far brighter than it predicted. <laughs> and by the way, Sir Charlie Bean, a former Bank of England deputy governor, says economic forecasts should be taken with a pinch of salt. <laughs> the UK economy is still growing. Where are the doom-laden predictions of Cameron, Osborne's, and most of the bankers? Cameron said a leave vote would put a bomb under the economy. And on top of it, as I recall. Osborne predicted a do-it-yourself recession. Even poor old Morgan Stanley now predict a Brexit slowdown rather than a Brexit recession. Its own economic e economists predicted a sharp slowdown. UBS predicted that the FTSE index would crash more than a fifth. In fact, it's up 11%. <laughs> the bankers are wrong about Brexit, were wrong about ending boom and bust, and were wrong about the 2008 crisis. Even our Chancellor, or former Chancellor, seems to have missed all of his budget forecasts over the years. But unlike him, most of the bankers still have their jobs. <laughs> the Remain claim that leaving would make everybody £4,300 worse off. Where on earth did that figure come from? or the claim by our shadow chancellor John MacDonald and former Prime Minister Gordon Brown that Labour would get an extra £35 billion funding from the EU if we remained. Another myth. The economy continues to grow. House prices and sales are up. Exports are up. Investment plans are up. Retail sales are up. And 27 countries have approached us already for trade deals. How wrong can these experts be? Even the numbers on the dole are up, 
Sorry, Dan. <laughs> I'll read that again. Even the numbers on the dole fell. Well, we can wait for the three million job losses the gloomsters forecast. What about the five million plus jobs the EU will lose? Two major overseas banks, SOCGEN of France and the giant American bank Wells Fargo, have both re reiterated their intention to open new headquarter offices and trading floors in London. Even Sir Martin Sorrell, head of advertising giant WPP and a fervent Remain supporter, says his global company is benefiting from a post-Brexit recovery and the, lower, and the lower pound makes our exports more competitive. All these Remain scares remind me of the Remain man on Westminster Bridge who saw another man on the parapet about to jump into the river. He grasped the man firmly by the ankles and asked him what he thought he was doing. The man who was about to jump mumbled something about recession, trade barriers, economic disaster and war if we voted leave. The Remain man asked him to come down and tell him all about it. A vote to leave surely could not be as bad as all that. Five minutes later they both jumped off the bridge. <laughs> My wife told me no joke, so that's why I did it. <laughs> without, without Nigel's inspirational leadership, none of this would have been possible. But let, let us also not forget those who founded the party and grew it and held UKIP together for all those years in the wilderness. We owe a huge debt of gratitude to Nigel and to all of you and the 17 and a half million people who voted to leave. And may I add to Richard Desmond, <coughs> Chairman of Express Newspapers and Hugh Witto, Editor of the Daily Express, for his splendid and unfailing support over many years for the beliefs that we as UKIP hold. <laughs> Even though I'm Deputy Chairman of Express, unpaid, <laughs> unpaid, so I didn't have to say that, <laughs> I only received one somewhat grumpy call from Nigel during the whole campaign, which I thought was pretty good. But let us not forget, in electing a new leader after a very strong leader, there may be disgruntled members who seek to disrupt the party. This must be avoided at all costs. Yeah. One only needs to look at what happened in the Conservative Party after Margaret Thatcher was forced out. It had a succession of leaders who were unable to establish their authority, and it disappeared into the wilderness for many years. Let us rally round our new leader, whoever that may be, and all pull together. The fight is not over yet, and there might still be an early election if the Prime Minister cannot get her programme approved by Parliament. However, we should not be frightened by, all, by an election because I don't really understand what we're talking about. We now have, thanks to Cameron changing the law, five-year parliamentary terms, and an early election can only be called if the House of Commons resolves that this House has no confidence in Her Majesty's Government, or if the House of Commons, with the support of two-thirds of the total membership, resolves that there should be an early parliamentary election. We're looking at the state of the Labour Party. I have to say, turkeys don't vote for Christmas.
Difficult as an early election is, therefore, we must be united and ready. However, with our increased and hopefully increasing support in the country, we should now take the opportunity to review and revise our constitution and rule book if needed. This must inevitably include revisiting the role of the NEC, who have done much valuable unpaid work. And in my opinion, a small group of, say, six should be formed by the new leader to make recommendations to you, the members. Be magnanimous in victory and gracious in defeat. Sadly, many of the Romanians seem unable to accept the result. You know, I feel like asking them to a funeral to cheer them up a bit. When you think that one and a half million more voters voted to leave than remain out of a record number who voted, you have to ask, do they ever do their homework? If at the last election, 20,000, yes, 20,000 voters in the most marginal conservative seats had instead voted for the runner-up, the conservatives would have lost over 20 seats and thus their majority. Is that marginal enough to call another general election? We are not Brussels when a country votes against the Lisbon Treaty. They ask them to go on voting until they vote in favour. There were two organisations vying for the official designation in the referendum. The winner getting a government grant and the ability to raise and spend more on the campaign. These were Vote Leave and Go Movement, or Leave EU. I was on the board of Go with Nigel. The chairman was Richard Tice. We did not get the designation not because I was on the board, <laughs> at least I hope not, largely, I think, because the cabinet ministers joined the Vote Leave. Vote Leave refused to work with us, try as hard as we could. A committee was formed in Parliament by Vote Leave to which we were invited. Like many large committees, it did not seem to achieve a great deal, except to be not the least bit interested in my suggestion that we should all work together with UKIP which I thought quite bizarre, as without Nigel and UKIP, there would never have been a referendum. Yeah. Sadly, even the government does not want our help in negotiating Brexit. As far as the campaign was concerned, it seemed to me that we, until we got onto the subject of immigration, we were in danger of losing. The Vote Leave campaign did not until they saw the writing on the wall, want to discuss immigration. Even amongst a group supposedly working together, one of us was described by one MP on the Vote Leave side as toxic. Well, toxic enough to gain 17 and a half million votes. <laughs> it is not racist to talk about the problems of mass immigration. 700,000 gross a year, this is the figure to concentrate on, inaccurate as it may be, when you consider vastly more national insurance numbers are issued to non-British citizens a year. I suspect we have no real idea what the true figures are. The No campaign deploying a President Obama, back of the queue, he, he forgot to find out the queue consisted only of the EU, which could not because of the conflicting demands of the French and the Germans and 26 other countries achieve anything. The EU has not agreed a single one of the 27 chapters that make up that treaty, TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Plus, that treaty, TTIP, threatened a Pandora's box of corporate lawsuits. In healthcare, for example, the US desire for companies who felt excluded from foreign countries on public services by governments should be able to sue those governments in order to, to participate or get compensation. They could compete to run the NHS, which could therefore, under that agreement, have been virtually privatized. Think how much easier it will be for one country, the UK, to negotiate trade deals. After all, Norway did it in seven months or deploying Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, John Major, Mrs. Merkel, Holland, the IMF, CBI, and every Tom, Dick, and Harry were, in my view, counterproductive. 
As we know, for example, one of the CBI's major contributors, in money terms, is the EU. And the latest farce of the Governor of the Bank of England, claiming that their forecast before and action after the vote helped to steady the ship and meant the facts were not as bad as they might have been. <laughs> well, I'm only a Cambridge economist, but from my... From, I couldn't get into Oxford. <laughs> But from my business experience, a quarter point cut in interest rates and maybe buying a few bonds makes not a halfpenny's worth of difference for anything. Furthermore, how could such a minor gesture have an effect on the economy so quickly? One might ask why are we cutting interest rates in the first place, just as inflation is picking up. Brexit will not cause a loss of confidence in the UK economy, and bearing in mind all the doomsday forecasts, the resilience of all the major indicators since the vote is remarkable. The bank created the impression that exiting would spell economic disaster. Now all is serene. Why did they not say before that this disaster could be avoided by a quarter point cut in interest rates? <laughs> it's it, it's impossible to believe. The Treasury were just as bad. What a terrible shame that both bodies did not remain independent and above the fray. We were, we were not greatly concerned with Project Fear. Cameron and co, having won the general election on Project Fear, thought they could repeat the process, a major mistake. Of course we made mistakes too, but we had you on the ground, the whole UKIP organisation, Aaron Banks and all his telephone conversations, canvassing. As they say, you cannot win a war without boots on the ground. Remainers were so busy fiddling around West Westminster that they missed the plot. <laughs> and may I just add, never underestimate an opponent, especially a swivel-eyed, blinkered loon and a fruitcake. <laughs> There have been lots of suggestions of where after Brexit, ranging from here to Albania, the Norway option, Switzerland, EEA, EFTA, and for me the best option in order to avoid all the endless pressure groups is either to declare the UK a free trade area or join the World Trade Organization. Yeah. And to do it as soon as possible. Let us pause on Germany for a moment. We hear all sorts of scare stories about trade after Brexit, and the previous speaker put it extremely well. As an excellent report by Barclays Bank points out, Germany's current account trade surplus with the UK is nearly 2% of Germany's GDP. The UK is Germany's third largest export market, with £80 billion pounds worth of sales a year. Germany's exports to the UK increased by 50%, 50% from 2010 to 2015. 8% of German goods exports come to the UK. Cars and other vehicles were half their trade surplus with the UK. Does anyone seriously believe they want trade barriers against UK goods? <laughs> Of course there will be problems, but to try and satisfy every pressure group is impossible. The threat that many companies will relocate should be ignored. Sooner or later people will realize that to relocate businesses to France, Italy, Spain, <laughs> Greece, <laughs> Turkey, or even Germany presents a huge and rising risk when you look at the state of the EU. I, I do know Turkey's not in it yet. <laughs> you have even seen Mr. Verhofstadt, if that's how, how you pronounce it, their new head EU negotiator on Brexit. Here is a man who knows his business, saying that we, the UK, are rats leaving a sinking ship. <laughs> Yeah.
if that is what he thinks of his employer, why should we want to sink with it? I do not understand the obsession of the Westminster bubble to stay in the single market. Of course we want tariff-free trade with the rest of the EU, but single market means unlimited immigration, all the EU rules and regulations, and the, would you like to go and make the speech? <laughs> you do it better than me. <laughs> You've only got to read it. <laughs> now, where was I? <laughs> All the EU's rules and regulations and the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. We do not want to be in the single market. We want free trade. Our negotiating strength is much stronger than some realise. So the EU gets two years if, when, we exercise Section 50. If there is no agreement, we just leave at the end of the two years. They will fall over themselves to do a deal. And one day later, we will open and finalise fairly quickly trade deals with the rest of the world. Our aim should be to turn the UK into a low-tax economy. Thanks to Brown's and Osborne's fiddling, we have a tax code that is nightmarishly complex and a major drag on the economy. The new Chancellor keeps on saying the result of the vote is a surprise. <laughs> well, although in fairness he does not seem to be the only one. In Iraq there was no plan B. One would have hoped Mr Cameron would have learnt from that experience. But sadly, he does not seem to have had a plan B in Libya either after Gaddafi was overthrown. And now we discover that the government and civil service did virtually none, if any, planning if the government lost the referendum. What were they all doing? The new Chancellor has a great opportunity to make major simplification and reform. Let us hope he does it. It must be fair, and big businesses must pay their due amount, but it must be simple and offer incentives. Let us have a low tax and free trade economy and have it soon. And let us get on with Brexit, either by repealing the 72 European Communities Act yeah. or exercising Section 50 of the Lisbon Treaty or declare UDI. The longer we delay, the more entrenched negotiation, negotiating positions will become. We are assuming that while we, from a zero starting position, because of the disgraceful failure of the poor, prior administration of the civil service to make any preparations for a leave vote, that we have all the time in the world. Immigrants are flooding in, our social services are being overwhelmed, and our opponents, the EU, are planning their approach and seeking to present a united front in their negotiations with us. Why are we, we giving them so much time to prepare? The great British people have given the government their instructions. Get on with it and stop fiddling around. Yeah.